Uh, Last week, we kind of opened up the idea of what it means to be salt and light, what it means to be uh, evangelists for Jesus, and uh, it's more than standing on the street with a bullhorn. Uh, And last week, we talked about uh, being ready and being prepared, how to have that yes and I'm ready kind of spirit. And if you were here last week, uh, towards the end of my message, this was kind of the big idea. We read from 1 Peter, and it says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. Everyone who what? Ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. See, if you are living for Christ, all of you, there has been a change on the inside of you. There is a hope that you have deep down in you and as a people and as a church, man, I want us to always be ready. I want us to be ready when somebody says, hey, what's different about you? How did you just walk through hell with a smile on your face? How did you just go through that difficult situation and on the other side, while I saw it was hard work and while I saw that, you know, it was wavy and bumpy, but you're still standing, you're still smiling. How, 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 well, there's a hope that I have and it's Jesus Christ. And so I gave you some homework last week and I said, I want everyone to go home and craft a simple statement, not a paragraph, not a book report, but a simple statement to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now here's what I've learned, not to take a show of hands when you ask uh, if you did the homework because you guys have all graduated and homework is a tough thing for you. But what I did do is I had them put a social media post out there and I just said, if you did the homework, let us hear about it. And a few people responded in. And so I wanna show you uh, what some of you said in this room when it comes to the hope that's in you. And as I read these, I think it's worth celebrating because uh, the the people that that you're gonna hear from Right now, this is the maybe the person to your left or right. There's a hope in them, and, and it is amazing what God has done in their life. And so just four real quick that I thought were really cool. Uh, somebody said, because he's proven himself to be who he claims to be in my life. Come on, that's awesome. He's proven himself to be who he claims to be in my life. So when they're interacting with somebody and it's like, man, why do you serve Jesus? You know, that kind of like that moment where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you're a Christian. That's right, I am, because he's proven to be who he claims to be in my life. Somebody else said this, because he was there when no one else was. Come on, how many of you, that's your story. He was there when nobody else was there. He was there on that dark and stormy night. He was there in that moment you were alone on the side of the road, you didn't know what to do. He was there when you couldn't fall asleep that night, and he showed up, he was was there. Somebody else put this, uh, when I should not have had joy, he was my joy. Man, I love that. Come on, is that anybody's testimony out here? The devil tried to take the joy out of you. Life tried to take the joy out of you, but you had joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, joy is better than happiness. Happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal and from God. And the last one was this, I encountered a love that healed me and that has never failed me. I love that. Come on, why don't you celebrate just those simple statements. And so if you didn't do your homework last week, I wanna challenge you to go back and uh, turn in the assignment. Um, So now you understand the assignment, let's turn it in. Uh, There is no test, but you do need to always be prepared. You never know when the test is gonna come. You never know when that coworker is gonna come up to you and say, why is it? Like, while we're all out, you know, Sunday morning having brunch and mimosas, why is it that you go to church every Sunday? What do you get from that? Well, why, why is it that you talk about, why is it that I see a Bible on your desk? Always be prepared. And how do you be prepared? Well, craft a simple statement to show the hope in which you have, because here's the reality. All of us are meant to shine. All of us are meant to, to be a city on a hill. We read this scripture last week, and I think it's kind of the, the thesis scripture uh, for the, for the uh, last week and this week's talk, and it's from the book of Matthew, where Matthew 5 in the message says this, let me tell you why you are here. And so why are you here? Well, let me tell you why you're here, Jesus says. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Here's another way to put it, in case that wasn't clear. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be light 
bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. I want you to say that with me. God is not a secret to be kept. He's not a secret to be kept. No, let's go public with this. As public as a city on a hill. See, here's what I know, and here's, I think, the enemy sometimes wants to, I think wants to trip us up, or maybe it's just human nature, that because faith is a personal journey, how many of you know that? Faith is personal, right? Like, I, I can't own your faith for you. Your parents can't own your faith. It's a, it's a personal thing. See, while our faith is a personal thing, it was always meant to be public, not private. See, your faith, while personal, it is personal. You have to give your life to Christ. You have to determine to walk with the Lord. So you have a personal faith, but it was never meant to stay private. It was always meant to be public. Again, what did it say a minute ago? It said this. It says, let me tell you why you are here. And then it goes on to say, God is not a secret to be kept, but we're going public with this. Your faith is personal, but it's also public. Your faith is personal, but it's never private. It was always meant to shine. It was always meant for people to look at you and say, man, there's something different about you. There's a hope that you have, and I'd love to know it. And so your faith, while personal, was never meant to be private, but, but public. But you know what I've noticed? Sometimes this is hard. It's hard in 2023 to have a, have a public faith. People with public faith get canceled. People with public faith get misunderstood. People with public faith are, you know, called crazy or, you know, people with public faith, they're, they lose followers. They don't get the likes. And so I get it. I get that sometimes this can be a challenging idea, but we've got to get past that. I got a text this morning from a friend, his name is Stefan, and Stefan, he's always been a prayer warrior. I mean, he shows up randomly. He never calls me to ask how it's going. He just sends me videos of what God just spoke to him about me. And here's what the video, and it's been three or four months since he sent one. Stefan sent a video this morning. He said, here's what I'm praying today for you, and here's what I believe the Lord is asking me to pray over you. That this morning as you preach, that your church's eyes would be open to what God wants them to be open to. And so I don't know if that was prophetic or I don't know if that was meant to be, but here's what I think God wants you to see today. God wants you to see that there is a mission that he has called us to. And sometimes it is so easy to turn in and say my faith is just all about me. It's a private, personal faith. It is personal, but it should not be private. God wants us to awaken our eyes. It's, it's like when he looked at his disciples after the woman at the well encounter, and he looked out and he said, guys, you see the harvest out there? It's white and ready. It's ready for you. And so pray for workers. Pray for laborers. Pray that their, in other words, their eyes would be open to see what's in front of them. My prayer is today, your eyes would be open to see the the lost loved one that is in front of you. My prayer is that you would see the lost person at your job. My prayer is that you would see the lost person in the grocery store. But for whatever reason, this can be hard. Sometimes it's just because we're simply afraid. And you're not the only one that's ever struggled with that. Paul told Timothy as he looked at him, he said, Timothy, I know you're afraid, but God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power. See, in your fear, God wants to give you power. That's what the Holy Spirit came for. In Acts chapter two, it said that the Holy Spirit would come upon you and it would give you power to be his witnesses. And so the Holy Spirit wants to come on you to give you power to go public in our world. And so he says, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but let me remind you, he's given you power. You have power. When you said yes to Jesus and when you said yes to the Holy Spirit, God put something on you that is ready to be awakened. There is a potential in you. There is a power in you that is ready to be tapped into. And it's tapped into when you just decide, I'm not gonna be afraid. 
And so Paul goes on to say, so, so never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. There's a power that's in you that wants to dispel fear so you never have to be ashamed to tell others. And so maybe you feel afraid, and I get that. I've been afraid before. When I get afraid to tell others about Christ, it usually shows uh, itself in nervousness. I get super nervous, you know, and I say dumb things, you know. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, I, don't, I don't have to go. I've done some dumb things. I don't want to self-deprecate too much here, but, you know, there have been moments where I've like, I've been so nervous. Oh, what are they going to think about me? You know, there's always that little bit of insecurity. Like, if I tell them and they really know, it's like, or if I, you know, and we just, there can be fear. Or maybe sometimes you just don't feel qualified. You're like, I'm not a preacher. I just gave my life to Christ a couple weeks ago. You know, I just, I, I don't know a Bible. I don't even own a Bible. I don't know a Bible verse. If you don't own a Bible, we'll give you one. But you just, you feel disqualified because maybe you haven't grown up in church or maybe this hasn't been a part of your story. Maybe you are new to the faith. Or maybe you feel disqualified because you know your past. You're like, there's no way God wants to use me because he knows what I did last night. He knows what I did before I came to him and God doesn't use broken sinners like me. He uses pastors and preachers and people that have it all together. That's the type of people he uses. And you know what, just, just as a minute ago we saw, we saw this whole conversation play out of like, I know you're scared but there's power in you. We can go back to the Old Testament and we could look at the life of Moses. When God told Moses, hey, you're gonna go and you're gonna deliver, you're gonna be a part of delivering my people, you're gonna go and they're gonna get set free from, from the Egyptian slavery and Moses came to him and he said, said, Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I have never. Maybe that's how you feel sometimes. It's like, I know you want me to tell others, but I have never. I have never fill in the blank. I have never been eloquent. I have never been prepared. I have never been ready. My, my story isn't yes and I'm ready. My story is no and I'm not ready. I have never, and he goes on to give his list of excuses. I've never been eloquent, not in the past, nor, nor now. Neither in the past, nor have you even spoken to your sermon. I am slow of speech and tongue. And so Moses gives all of these excuses. He's like, hey, I got a plan for you. And he's like, yeah, but I'm not eloquent. Neither in the past nor since you've spoken to me. Like even now, like in this moment, this doesn't make me any better. You just gotta know, like I'm slow of speech. My, my tongue's all messed up and I, I just don't think I could do this. And then the Lord says to him, who gave you your mouth? I think that's funny. Uh, who gave you your mouth? <clears throat> All right, I mean, just imagine this playing out. Hey God, this thing doesn't work right. I, don't call me to do this, I'm disqualified. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a speaker. He's like, oh really, who gave you that mouth? Yeah. Who, makes, who makes them deaf or mute? Who, who gives sight to the blind? Fill in whatever your I have never is. All right, whatever your excuse is, who told you that? Who has the power to, to overcome that? He says, is it, is it not I, the Lord? I love that question. Is it not I, the Lord? I mean, I created this whole thing. I hold the world in the palm of my hands. Is it not I that can overcome any excuse that you have? It says, so now go. Go, quit making excuses. I will help you. I'll help you speak and I'll teach you what to say. I could just stop right there. Church, go. God will help you. He'll help you speak what you need to speak and teach you what you need to say. Just go. Now here's what you have to do. While he could do this, he could, like a ventriloquist, you know, puppet, open your mouth and make you start speaking, but he chooses not to. He will give you the words to say, but you've got to open your mouth. You've got to give it to him and say, okay, God, I trust that what comes out will be from you, and so I'm going to open my mouth. So maybe you feel afraid, maybe you feel disqualified, or... 
I think this is many of us, this next one, you just feel complacent. Or maybe you've never thought about that, but the reality is you are complacent. What do I mean by that? Well, you just aren't living life on assignment. Last week, we, we, we discussed the idea that all of you, once you give your life to Christ, you are called. You are chosen to be witnesses for him. It was the last command that he gave his disciples and it should be our first priority. See, when Jesus came, he was on mission and he had a mission. It said, last week we read this, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And so he came on a rescue mission for lost people. Thank God that he came on that rescue mission because you're here today because of a rescue mission. You're living for God today because he died for you on a cross. But it wasn't just for you, and so we've got to go public with this. We have to, and it's the title of my sermon today, we have to have a posture in us that says, yes, and I'm ready. See, Moses says, no, I can't. But a faith-filled person of God says, yes, and I'm ready. I may not have it all together, I may not know what to say, but yes and I'm ready. I'm ready, speak through me, talk through me, minister through me, show me what needs to happen. See, Jesus came on rescue mission, then he commissioned us, he said, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you, so go. And so how do you do that? Last week we kind of just just scratched the surface with with one of the ways you, you, you do it is first you gotta understand your why. You can never be practic- you can never really get practical when it comes to evangelism till you understand first why you're even serving Christ. And so none of these that I'm about to give you, the three things, uh, matter until you start with last week. If you didn't go the homework, do the homework last week, you need to know why you're serving God. Why are you showing up every week? Why are you serving him? Why are you, you know, what is your why? And once you know your why, then let me give you some real practical things. Three things that you can do to begin to share your faith, all right? Number one, you can use what you have. You can use what you have. Has anyone seen The Chosen? A couple of you guys, there's a beautiful uh, scene in there uh, where, where Jesus, he, he locks eyes after this, this tax collector has kind of been following uh, Jesus' journey and kind of watching him, and then Jesus locks eyes with him and is like, Matthew, uh, come follow me. And Matthew in a moment just like drops everything and he goes and he follows him. And Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, he wasn't a preacher. He, he didn't know, you know, he didn't have a sermon in him. Uh, he didn't grow up, you know, knowing all the ins and outs. No, he, he was a tax collector. Now, he had influence, though, and most likely he probably had some wealth that other people didn't have. And so when Jesus calls him, Matthew's response, and I want you to see this, Matthew, also known as Levi, he responds to the invitation to follow Jesus in this way. It says that after he followed Jesus, that Levi held a great banquet for Jesus. In other words, he held a great meal, a great party. I looked up this word great in the Greek just to see like, was this like a couple people or what does it mean? It held, he held a a, a big, uh, the, the simplest way is a big party with many people, not like a couple people over. No, he got out the grill. I mean, he hooked up the flat screen. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He said, come on, we're having a big get together. He invited all of his friends. But I want you to look who he invited. He invited all of his friends to his house and a large crowd of guess who gathered around? People like him. Tax collectors. See, he had influence. You have influence with people like you. And the first people that gathered around were the, so who is like you? You know, there's people like you far from God. And they need to be invited. Invited to what? Well, maybe it's to a party. Maybe it's to a a gathering. He invites them to a gathering. A large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. And the Pharisees came and they were like, what is going on? It says the Pharisees came and the teachers of the law who belong uh, to their sect and begin to complain. And look what the scripture goes on to say. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
And Jesus answered them, says, is it not the healthy? Or he says, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but is it not the sick? See, the healthy don't need a doctor. Who needs a doctor? The sick. None of you ever go to the doctor when you're healthy. I mean, maybe you go for an annual exam, but most of the time you go because you're sick. And he says, I've come to call, what? Not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And so Matthew gathers this big party around him and he says, hey, I don't have it all together. I don't know how to follow Jesus yet. I don't know all of his teachings. I haven't seen all the miracles, but I do know how to do something. I know how to have a party and I got people that will come. And so he throws a party and what a beautiful party it must have been. And so where do you start when it comes to to telling other people, well maybe it starts by just simply saying, you know what, I'm gonna use what I have. Can you cook? Then cook. Invite people to a meal. Do you have a boat? This summer, invite people to the lake. I know this is rocket science. Somebody over here, do you know Jesus? You just, Billy just raised his hand if you have a boat and he wants to help you evangelize. I saw you over there. Do you have season tickets to XYZ team? Invite somebody to the soccer match with you. Invite a neighbor that doesn't know you. Invite a coworker. Use what you have. See, it's not about, you know, just it's not always saying, hey, come to my house, let's do a Bible study. No, come to my house. I'm really great at grilling. And guess what? Somewhere along the way, they're going to see the light that's in you. They're going to see the hope in which you have. And then when they do, you're always prepared. Oh, I'm glad you asked. There is a hope that's in me. There is a hope that's in me. And so you can, you can do this. Whatever you have. I put this at the end, the fill in the blank. Do you enjoy going to the whatever? Whatever this is, somebody else probably enjoys that too. And so use what you have. Number two, if you're taking notes, is this. You can share your story. So you can use what you have, and then you can share your story. All of you have a story. And let me give a hint to what it is. It probably has something to do with the statement that you created last week. Last week, you created a statement, hopefully, and it is the thesis sentence to the story in which you have. And so I'm glad you asked. I am prepared. I didn't have joy, but now I have joy. Oh, tell me more. There it is. And now you've got a story, and I promise you, God can use your story to make a difference. There was a blind man once and he was blind and um, Jesus goes on to, to heal this blind man and then you know they start kind of complaining in, in the back and then the blind man starts hurling out kind of what's happening and I want you to see, see this picture here. The blind man hurls out from the back. He replies, whether he's a sinner or not, this is what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, He just healed you. Why is he healing like that? Why is he doing it that way? Why you? I mean, all these questions. He's like, I don't know. I don't know why he did it this way. I don't know why he chose me. I didn't have it all together, but what I do know is I was blind story, and now I see. Maybe you don't have it all together, but there's a story in you. You were blind, but now you see. The story goes on, it says, then they asked them, uh, what did he do to you? I love that. I'm glad you asked. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, said, I've already told you. Did you not listen? You want to hear it again? That's how I read that. What do you want to hear it again? That's just how I imagine that scene. Like, I already told you I was blind, but now I see, but you want to hear it again? I don't know. What I do know is I was blind, but now I can see. And then he's like, do you want to become his disciples too? Do you want to follow him too? This is awesome, ain't it? Sometimes we overcomplicate this. There's a story in you. 
There was a man that had a bunch of demons and begged him to go out of them, and Jesus sent him away. And then after he sent him away, he said this, now return home and tell how much God has done for you. You have a story. Go and tell it. How do you share your faith? Use what you have. If you can cook, cook. If you like going to basketball, go to basketball, but invite somebody with you. Maybe for you, it's a simple story where there was a moment of pain in your life and now God wants to take that pain and use it to impact somebody else. You have a story. Now go and tell it. If you're like, I don't know what my story is, do the homework last week. It matters. It matters. And then the last is this, and this is usually the first thing we jump to, but it's just part of it. But this is, I think, a big opportunity. You can invite someone to church. What is this not? This is not about filling all these seats. Wow. I believe that God longs for every seat to be full. See, every every number, it actually does matter. We kind of are a numbers church because every number represents a person. Aren't you glad we're a numbers church? Because that means you're a number. You're a number. And guess what? Your number has a name. Your name matters to God. And you have a story. And so all of you matter. So you can invite someone to church. We see Jesus with the woman at the well. She has this amazing encounter with him. He radically changes her life. You can go look up the story in John chapter 4 and after this moment where there is a story to be told, honestly, there's this amazing encounter and Jesus is like, you've been drawing water, but I'm living water. I've got something in me that if you drink, you'll never thirst again. Like that's who I am. And so she leaves her water and the woman goes back to town and she says to the people, come and see a man. Listen, I can't tell you everything about him, but come with me. Come see him. Let me introduce you to him. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? It surely must have been. How did he know all this? And it says they came out of the town and made their way towards him. See, she didn't just invite, she brought. I'm almost certain that they were like, where was this Messiah? Come with me, I'll show you. Where did you get this hope? Ah, come with me, I'll show you. You've heard my story, we've shared a meal. Now why don't you come experience the God that I know? Oh church, it's more than just a a place where they sing song and preach sermons. It's a place where I've encountered God. It's a place where God has healed me and saved me and set me free. Come and see. Let me bring them to you. Or let me bring you to him. So how do you know who you should invite to church? Let me give you three things. And I stole this from someone I heard a long time ago and I never forgot it. Three clues, like when people are ready for church. Three little knots, they call it. Number one is if they're not in church, that should be an obvious. Here's a clue. It's like, man, I used to go to church, but I'm not in church. Oh, really? Let me hear more. And then don't bash that other church. You know, I used to go to church, but then they hate. Well, you should come to my church. They don't do that to people. That's not, no, 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 no. Oh, really? You should give God a shot again. Why don't you come to church with me this Sunday? So when you encounter someone and they're not in church, that's a good sign to invite them to church. Here's another sign. Man, things are not going so well. Man, I just, I had this moment and I had this situation and things are not going so, oh really? You should come to church with me. What if that was our first response? What do you mean I should go to church? Well, let me tell you what God did for me. 
always be prepared. Yes, I'm ready, Lord. Or maybe I'm not prepared for. Man, we just had a kid and it rocked my world. We weren't prepared for this. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. There was a time I wasn't prepared for it. Oh, I just lost my job. It came out of nowhere and I wasn't prepared for it. Oh, I get it, I get it. You should come to church with me. What do you mean? Well, let me tell you what I mean. I I walked through some seasons I wasn't prepared for. There was a moment where things weren't going well. I get church hurt. You should come to church with me. Let's practice that, all right? Whatever, whatever, and then your response is, you should come to church with me, all right? Things aren't going well. I wasn't really prepared. I know it's silly. But what if, what if we were always ready? What if we lived with this posture? Yes, I'm ready, Lord. Show me. All it takes is one invitation. Someone invited you. Maybe it was one invitation or maybe it was a thousand. But one invitation could be all it takes to change a life. And so how do you evangelize? How do you share your faith? I know you're scared. I know you feel disqualified. You may be a little complacent. Well, guess what? Just use what you have. Share your story and then say, you should come to church with me this Sunday. This Sunday. And so here's what I want you to do. Get out your phone right now. Everyone get out your phone. You don't have to, but if you'd like to. I can't make you do anything. Who are five people this year? Right now, God, speak. Who are five people this year? Not this week, this year, that you can reach for Christ. Five people. Every one of you knows someone, someone far from God, but close to you. There is someone close to you that doesn't have the hope that you have. Who are they? Five people. And here's what I want you to start doing immediately. And maybe you already are hearing names. Write them down right now. Just put them in there. Who are five people? Here's what I want you to start doing with them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Put them on your fridge. Write them on your mirror. Put them on the lock screen of your cell phone. And may our eyes be opened again to the mission. Jesus left and he commissioned us and said, just as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Now just go. Use what you have. Share your story. Invite them to the, you know, to the place that you found so much hope. Go. And so would you start praying for them? And here's what I want you to pray. God, let them see you the way that I see you. And let there be a moment where I can use my story. I can can show and tell the goodness of God. There's a guy named Tom. And uh, I met Tom a few years ago in an organization called Leadership Fredericksburg. And uh, basically, Leadership Fredericksburg is a year-long leadership process where Uh, done by the city. It's not a church thing. It was a city that I lived in in Virginia. And during this process, you would be partnered with a business leader, kind of a high influence business leader in the city that signed up to influence like another leader in the city, like a mentor mentee relationship. And so um, I go to my first leadership Fredericksburg. And remember, this is going to be a year long process where the mentor commits to meeting monthly at the minimum, bi-monthly preferred with a mentee. And so I go to this business meeting and we're partnered afterwards and I sit down in front of Tom and I'm like, Tom's like, hey, this is what I do. I oversee the largest real estate company in this town. I build houses, da, 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 da. What do you do? I'm a pastor. And I saw Tom's face like, I'm like, are you okay? He's like, I'm an agnostic, is that okay? He's like, actually, I'm an atheist. I don't know what I am, but I'm not what you are. I'm like, that's okay. Really? 
Like, is this going to be weird? I won't make it weird if you don't make it weird. I mean, you know, we got to be together for the next year. And so I had to step back and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, do we have anything in common? I thought, well, Tom's a leader and he leads a team. I'm a leader. I've got staff. Let me take every leadership book that I've been forced to read and every leadership teaching that I get on podcast and let me just start being intentional with that. I don't know anything about real estate. I don't know anything about building houses, so I cannot add any value. But when he talks about his team, we can have conversation there. And so guess what? Every other week we started having coffee, talking about leadership. We talked about managing budgets for our organizations. It was never a church. Oh yeah, I do that in my organization too. We talked about leading people. We talked about firing people. All the things that I, I was getting to do. And so we just encouraged one another. He, he grew to enjoy those conversations. We even sent books back and forth that we were reading. One time, he even almost thought about inviting me to come teach his team and then he bailed. You know, I think he got a little scared, like, wait, he's a Christian. Uh, I don't know what he'll say. Well, guess what happened six months into that journey? The atheist agnostic set two seats behind me on Christmas service. Did he give his life to Christ that night? Nope. Did he show up again? Not that I know of. Is he in church today? Maybe. But a seed was planted. And somebody that barely knew how to interact with a Christian sat in church with one because I just used what I had. It's not my responsibility to save them, it's God's. But it is my responsibility to show and tell, to use what I got. I prayed for him to be in that service and he showed up and I got no idea when that seed will come to fruition, but in Jesus' name, if it hasn't already, I believe it will one day. So who are your five? Can you pray for them? And when you leave today, here's your homework today that you can do today before you leave. Very easy. In the foyer, there's a banner on this side of the church. It says, for the one, for the one. Um, And here's what I want you to, to write a name on that banner. Who's the one person this year? Like who's at the top of the five? Write them on the banner. Fill in the blank. For the one, who's the one? And if they're ready, invite them with you to Easter. Because everyone almost expects an invitation at Easter. And so it's a good, easy, you should come to church with me this Easter. You should bring your kids. There's a petting zoo. There's some eggs. They'll like it. And so you guys can take this TV away. Would you close your eyes? I want to ask you two questions. First question is this, what do you think God's saying to you today? What's God saying to you today? And number two, what do you need to do about it? Who's your one? 